What's going on, everybody? Thank you so much for tuning in to another Daily Devotional. I'm Pastor Adam, uh, and today I want to take the time to wrap up uh, talking about Micah. Uh, if you watched uh, the last couple of Wednesdays that I've been on here doing the Daily Devotionals, I've been talking about Micah and going through the book of Micah, and it's a series that I've been doing with our students. So uh, we just wrapped up this past Sunday uh, talking about Micah, and so I want to kind of share a little bit of some of the major insights uh, of what we discussed and talked about this past Sunday. And so, getting towards the end of Micah, we get in like chapter 6, man, it, it gets really, really fascinating. Because throughout the book, Micah has attacked these sinful behaviors uh, in different ways and different writing styles. You look through the book of Micah, and he he's kind of approached each of these different things kind of like with a different writing style because he knows how to communicate to the audience. He, that's what he's intentionally trying to do. He's trying to uh, talk to them in a way that they're going to grasp and understand understand it better. So, you know, you look at, uh, look at chapter 6 and a lot of scholars believe that this is taking place at the end of, of Hezekiah's reign um, and leading into his son, uh, who completely did not follow in his father's footsteps. Uh, he, Hezekiah might have been the one king that was referenced in Jeremiah that really listened to Micah and him and the people turned from their wicked ways. But when his reign ended and his son took up the throne, completely undid all that. Just immediately turned back to uh, the abuses of the poor, which was a major uh, issue for the people at the time. And so... Uh, what kind of has happened as, as Micah is approaching here in chapter 6, he's, he changes his language again, but he goes into the language of a courtroom. Um, and so it, it, it was kind of different than it is now, of course, as, as it was back then. But kind of the summary of the legal presentation is, is you see the first couple of verses uh, in chapter 6. You know, it, you know he kind of what he does is he, he's like where the courtroom is, uh, or, you know, where this is happening, uh, here's why, kind of like the hearing, this is happening, why why this is, this, this hearing is taking place, here's the reasons why, you know, the people are bringing brought to court, uh, so to speak. And then verses 3 through 5 are kind of God's accusations against them and defense for himself. Um, and so he's essentially saying, look, we had a covenant, I kept my side, I, I did my deal, but you didn't. Um, and then the next verses uh, find Micah kind of he's kind of quoting what the people had been saying, kind of like their excuses that they had of not keeping their end of the bargain. And so, uh, and that's what's happening when Micah is quoting their responses. They're trying to make excuses. They're trying to justify why they did or were doing what what they did. And and in verse eight, God would say. No, this is what you're supposed to do. If you do it, this is how you get restored to me. This is how we make amends. This is how we make everything right. And so we kick off, um, starting verse 1, it says, Listen to what the Lord is saying. Stand up and state your case against me. Let the mountains and hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a case against his people. He will bring charges against Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Answer me. So this is interesting because normally, even for a lawsuit kind of back in the day, if you took someone to court, uh, you'd get up in front of a judge and you'd say, I have brought so-and-so uh, to court today because they did this or they did that. Here's my evidence for why th this, is, this person is a horrible person uh, and needs to be punished. That was just kind of right, you know, that's just the, the kind of the format of what happened. But see, in this courtroom case, in this scenario, God didn't quite do that. God began saying, hey, I brought you to court today, but I need to know, have I failed you in some way? You know, ha have I done something I uh, was, have I not done something I was supposed to do? Did I not love you enough? Did I... Did I not care for you enough? Did I make it too hard for you to follow me? You know, is there something that I had done to break the covenant that would result in you ignoring me or turning away from me? You know, so it's really 
need to see this, this is how God approached it. He he didn't come out accusing, you know, these people, you did this, you did this. He's like, hey, have I done something wrong in order for you to reject me? Because <clears throat> because that's the, in God's eyes, he kept everything. He kept up his deal. He followed and obeyed the covenant that laid out before the people. So really, there's no reason for the people to turn away from him. Yet they did. So he's kind of coming from this perspective of, have I done something wrong or not done something that I was supposed to? And so it goes on here to verse 4. It says, For I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to help you. So here is like God reminds them that not only did he help the people escape, he gave them incredible leaders. You know, it's really cool that God pointed out even Miriam in, in that verse, right? He even pointed out you know, the sister there that normally you wouldn't, necessarily think well what did she really contribute all you see is Moses and Aaron but it really brought that because she was a leader nonetheless and so he gave them these these three incredible leaders um and you know what have I done wrong there right and then he goes on and says don't you remember my people how King Balak of Moab tried to have you cursed and how Balaam son of Beor blessed you instead so here God is reminding them of a time where he transformed a curse into a blessing. And remember your journey from uh, uh, Acacia Grove to Gilgal uh, when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness. So this is, the, this is another example of how God had held up his end of the covenant. You know, he, he's using these examples um, to, to show that the God side of the covenant was held up. You know, God and Micah are kind of saying, here's how God's held up his end of the bargain. And there could be no doubt that God is faithful. And so then Micah goes on and he quotes to people and the excuses they had been using to justify their behavior. You know, and that kind of reveals their attitudes, right? He says in verse 6, what can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? So this is the people's response, right? And it's fascinating. I mean, they essentially said, so you're telling us we're not doing enough. So should we sacrifice more? Do you want more money in the offering? Uh, if you want more, we can, we'll kill more animals. Uh, we'll, we'll give you more olive oil. Uh, they, they even suggested killing off their firstborn. Uh, you know, <laughs> we'll be like, they kind of were essentially saying, we'll be like other religions and we'll give you all of our kids. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what they're coming from. So you break that all down, they're essentially asking, what more do we need to pay in order for you to be happy with us? Right, that that's their response to this. Is what what what? How much do we need? How much money do we need to throw at you? How much possessions? How much, you know, sacrificial stuff do you need in order to kind of pay off for your happiness? And man, I, that that would if, if that happened to me or that happened to any one of us, we would be kind of like just really burning alive at that person for even suggesting that, you know, to make a right to make amends, you got to pay me off or buy me off or whatever. So, so for the people to reveal this and see this in Scripture, it reveals a lot of their focus. You know, the reason Micah confronted them was because this money and this power had become their idols. You know, the people thought, once again, if you remember my other messages, uh, the other devotionals, the people had thought they were okay because they weren't like their northern brethren in Israel where they were, you know, openly worshiping other gods and false idols and things like that. They thought, well, we don't do anything down here. God's blessing us. But what Micah has revealed to them is that what their idols were, were money and power, and they were not doing what they should have been doing. So th this answer from the people really showed um, what their focus of their hearts was. They assumed God was mad at them because he wanted a bigger piece of the pie. They basically told God, just just name your price, and we'll make you happy, and we'll write that check. And they got caught up in that greed, uh, and they assumed that was what was important to God. Because once again, you got to remember that 
a lot of the people that were wealthy and, and really idolized these possessions, they're also being told by prophets, false prophets, that what they were doing was okay. That what they were doing was what God wanted them to do. And so they're completely led astray in this. And so they think that because they're like this, God, God's, they're similar, they're the same poet, so God just wants a bigger piece of the pie. He wants a bigger cut. Totally not the case, right? And so this this right here, the, 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 the revealing this focus from the people triggered Micah's response in verse 8 where he laid out what was really important to God. He said once again, I'm going to read it again. No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good and this is what he requires of you. Do what is right, to love mercy, and walk away humbly with your God. So he's saying, Micah's saying it's not about the stuff. It's never been about the sacrifices. It was never about giving the right kind of offering. It was always about your heart. Uh, what is your heart doing? How are you treating your fellow people? How are you interacting with the world around you? So, man, that, that, that cuts deep, if you think about it, if you let it. And it should, because, you know... The, the people's actions and the reaction to this is revealing what their focus was, which was this greed and this money and these, these possessions with their idols. And he says in, in verse 8, no, this is what is required of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And so that, it's it, you know, we can have traditions. We can sacrifice things. Even back then, God had put these sacrificial things in place, but it was never about the actual deed. It was about the heart behind that deed. That's what's crucial. You can't just do it and, oh, check mark done. I'm moving on. No, you have to really mean it. You have to, your heart has to be in that response, right? You have to, the heart has to be there. And so when God originally showed up to Abraham and made the covenant with him, he said one of the purposes of the covenant was to make them a blessing to the whole world. And, and not only are they not doing that, but they can't even be a blessing to their own people. And they knew better, right? But once again, these they fell into the, what they wanted, their needs, and, the, and these false prophets were feeding that. So, you know, you look, breaking down that verse 8, there, there's um, a couple of things to, to, to look at, breaking that down. First, doing what is right, right? That's what it says. So the law said, even back then, they were supposed to care for those in need. You know, the, the widows and the orphans and... And all that, but they had avoided that 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 part of the teaching. Uh, it it didn't change the fact that they didn't know, they, they they knew it. They knew that they were supposed to do that, but they just ignored that part of of, of God's teaching. And so, you know, you, you continue to see that in Old Testament, and it, 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 that principle is still made even you know emphasized more even in the New Testament, right? So Micah told him to stop using their power to benefit themselves. And instead, use it for what God intended. The second part of that is uh, to love mercy. This takes it a step further. So showing mercy to someone is showing grace to someone when you're not actually required to do so. You know, there, there's, there are circumstances that you clearly kind of commanded, you know, to help others. You know, to, to care for the widows and the orphans and those that are in need and poor and suffering. You know, so there's those... There are those that kind of command you, but, you know, to do what is right, mercy is putting someone ahead of yourself, even when no one is telling you to do that. So it's taking that, doing what is right, even a step further, going above and beyond that part, right? And then the last part of that is walk humbly with your God. And and you can, you know, this kind of completes what God's asking for, right? And you can take humbly, and it kind of can be also translated to wisdom. So, you know, essentially Micah is, you know, told him to walk with wisdom with God, right? You know, so in other words, if your walk is like God's walk, if you're pursuing God, if you have a covenant relationship with God, then how you walk in this world should reflect God. And so... Once again, it's revealing what that purpose is. It's revealing what your heart really is behind it. It's going to show the way you walk. You know, Peter and Paul and, and all the other apostles, they, they would go on to teach us as well. You know, they, they kind of taught that if God has come into your life, 
uh, and has transformed your heart, then you should naturally begin to act like Christ. You know, to kind of walk in God's wisdom. If we are walking with wisdom, you know, with God, then doing right things and showing mercy should start happen naturally. It should it should pour out. It should reflect that. And so, and and that's that's so crucial. God wants to change our heart. You know, Micah was ultimately asking, "Who are you trying to please?" Right. That was a big question. Are you trying to please yourself by a, a, a you know? amassing all these things, accumulating all these things, um, or are you trying to please God? You, you, we need to make sure that we have to ask that separate question, you know, are we trying to accum- uh, you know, accumulate or, or accumulate all, all kinds of these different things and status and power and all this stuff like that? Or are we trying to please God by blessing the world around us? You know, that's what Micah revealed to these people. And there's also four things we can highlight from this that we can really you know, take into our life. First thing is rituals are meaningless. You know, yes, God put these things in place, you know, these sacrificial things, you know, in the Old Testament, things like that. But once again, it was all about the heart behind it all. Performing the actual ritual is meaningless because it's all about what you really do, the heart of it. You know, going, showing up on Sundays or Wednesdays can be a ritual if you're not actually pursuing God in that time. You're just showing up, checking that off your list, saying, look, I went to church or I go to church. I, 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 I served. I served in all these different areas of ministry. Check, done. You know, it, it can become a ritual if there's no meaning behind that. If you're not being sincere, if you're not actually trying to pursue God while doing these rituals or doing these things that can seem like rituals. You know, secondly, our actions reveal our belief. So, our actions, what we do, you know, how we act, how we react to things around us, you know, that kind of reveals what we care about. You know, things that, that, that you talk about, the things that you get excited about, the things you go do, they reveal where your heart is. And so, you know, we, we, we always get interested and get passionate about different things, and so that kind of reveals where your heart is lying. So our actions reveal our belief. Third thing is, is that God cares about our heart. He cares about our heart. That's why he is so. He was pointing out to these people that it's not about the sacrifice. It's not about these burnt offerings and all stuff. It's about where your heart is. Where's the meaning behind it all? And then finally, we answer for how we treat others, right? I mean, back then the people they were not treating others very, very well. They were not doing what is right, and they're answering for it. You know, for us it may not be right away, but you know, we are going to come face to face with God someday and we're going to have to answer for how we treat other people. So, you know, Micah here highlighted the idea that if we truly belong to God, it's going to change how we act um, and how we treat people all throughout our life. I mean, everywhere we go. If that isn't happening in your life, if you're not conveying God, if you're not you're treating people the way God would want them to be treated then it might be time you know, for some tough questions to ask yourself. Am I with God or am I all talk and my actions reveal that? So I hope this challenges you. I hope this really just, I hope Micah is speaking to you. I hope he's dropping the bomb on your life right now. And even though you may not want to hear it, I hope you do hear it and I hope you do something about it because that's the difference. These people heard these words and under, you know, in one circumstance, they actually heeded it. They had a chance to, to respond, heartfelt respond, and seek forgiveness. Ignoring it, you know, you know, brushing it off, you know, not facing it, that's not going to help. So like I said, I hope this is encouraging. I hope this is also challenging uh, to you and your faith. So let me say a quick prayer. Thank you so, for, so much for sticking with me all, all these weeks going through Micah. Uh, and hopefully next week we'll have something special for you. Uh, I don't want to give anything away, but it'll be, it'll be awesome. So, dear God, thank you so much uh, for this time, Lord. Thank you for diving into your word. Thank you for the message you gave Micah to give to the people, God. And so, Lord, I just pray that you continue to be with us, keep us all healthy and safe. And there's been a lot of praises going around, uh, exciting things, God. And there's also been a lot of hardships and and, and, and loved ones lost, Lord. So I pray you just continue to give all of us strength 
give the leadership, give us leadership, the ability to, to, to encourage and uplift and be there for, for those that are in need, God. And I pray that we examine ourselves and make sure that we aren't looking out for ourselves and we are examining how we treat other people, that we are, are, are looking at uh, how we are, are, are serving you and how we are walking with you and, and we're humbly uh, you know, looking for your guidance in our life. And that if we are actively pursuing you, Lord, then our actions will reflect that. And so I just thank you so much for just who you are and what you do in our lives. Just continue to guide us, protect us, and keep us safe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for, for watching this, and we'll see you Sunday. Take care.